to one. Drive. Shout out to everyone who's had to spend a birthday or a holiday in lockdown during this pandemic. I had to do it for uh, my birthday. M my wife had to do it for Mother's Day. My mom didn't. Your daughter just did it for her birthday. How did that go? You know, it went really well, man. It was a great weekend. I was a little bit nervous about how she was going to react to it, but, you know, it was a nice family party and then uh, kind of a parade of friends going by with the, the whole drive-by birthday with balloons and stuff like that. She actually loved it. It was, a, it, was a, it, was a, it was a good experience. It was a great weekend. She loved it. So worked out well. Worked out well, bro. <laughs> I, I don't know what you got or is it? Well, you got the bike. I don't know what else she got, but I caught Scoob with the kids over the weekend. It was no Trolls World Tour, but, uh, you know, I like a little bit more mystery with my mystery gang. Yeah, so it seems like it was a little bit lacking. I did not get to see it. You know, the big birthday weekend playing with dolls and slime and stuff like that with the six-year-olds and, and that type of stuff. But uh, was it good? Was it, is it worth me catching it? Should I, should I buy it? Should I look at it? Uh, <laughs> well, you know what? It really depends on what your opinion is at. By the way, LinkedIn is, uh, if you get a black screen on LinkedIn, we apologize. That should be back up soon, hopefully. Good. Um, by the way, here's some, here's some bad news, man. Uh, U.S. non-retail stores, they jumped 20% in April, even as overall retail sales dropped 9% according to the U.S. Department of Commerce. I'm sorry, that's good news. Uh, grocery sales rose 13%, but apparel sales, that was the bad news. Their decline was 89%, pretty major. Wow, that is 89% in, uh, so retails, wow. And that's, uh, that's online retail uh, apparel. That's unbelievable. Yes, I, I thought it was I just heard. affecting pants, though, Dooner. I thought, so now it's uh, gone to all apparel? Well, the whole jeans economy is, like, wreaking havoc on, uh, like, Bangladesh and Vietnam. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That makes sense. Yep. And hey, for those of you on LinkedIn, good stuff. We're back up. We got the image on here. So join us in the comments section. More than happy to talk to you guys. All right. This month's What the Truck is sponsored by HubTech. HubTech just launched Tabby, a new task automation bot that helps you focus on what matters. To learn more, go to HubTech.com. Right we have a ton on. of headlines to get to, so let's do it. Let's do it. What's the first one we got here? Comcar, they filed for Chapter 11. They plan to sell five of their subsidiaries. Comcar, they were bigger than Celadon at the end. Did you know that, Michael Vincent? Yeah, I, I, I do now. Yeah, this is big news. They're in a tough position. They're a motor carrier holding company, Comcar Industries. They announced on Sunday, May 17th, yesterday, that it filed for court-supervised bankruptcy protection and planned to liquidate by selling off its five trucking companies. The company employs 4,500 people and has 4,000 trucks, according to Comcar's website. In terms of size, Comcar was bigger than Celadon when it filed bankruptcy in late 2019. But the, the pre-packaged bankruptcy that Comcar has organized will be more structured and seamless than the abrupt shutdown of Celadon, where that went down over a weekend and, and nobody knew what was happening. Yeah, well, it seems like they're doing a little bit more structured, obviously. It says it right there. And that's, that, that is actually good news. And three of the company's buyers were actually identified uh, in the disclosure, Dooner. So flatbed hauler CT Transportation will be acquired by uh, PS Logistics. Uh, which since the end of 2018 has also bought Celadon Logistics, Reichman Transport, and Robinette Trucking. Uh, ke the chemical carrier CTL Transportation will be acquired by uh, Service Transportation Incorporated, or STI, which is a broad-based carrier based in Houston. And MCT Transportation will be sold to White Willow Holdings, a private equity firm backed by New York Investment House Luminous Management, LLC. MCT Transportation is a refrigerated carrier that also provides dra drive van service uh, uh, Dooner, and you know, earlier this year we reported Freightwaves did uh, that Willow uh, White Willow uh, sought to acquire holdings of the part of the Celadon bankruptcy as well. So, uh, interesting news there. That's good stuff. Tony Anderson says, "Wow, huge!" Earlier this month, it was reported that White Willow is in discussions to buy Celadon's Mexican assets. Comcar also said it has entered into a letter of intent to sell CCC Transportation, a bulk carrier, a bulk carrier in CTTS repair. The identity of the intended purchaser was not disclosed, but uh, it doesn't seem to be White Willow. According to the company's website, Comcar dates back to 1953. CCC was the original company that launched that ultimately became Comcar, which was sold to private equity in 2016. We'll dive deeper into this with John Kingston because this is a big one. He'll be with us at 1230. Yeah, excellent. Another 
on and Labar Smith says uh, Jabar Smith says, is this the beginning of weaker, larger companies fallout? Yeah, we'll talk to John about that, but um, uh, my guess would be probably analysts. So here's a big one too, and, and this is what might fuel some of that. Analysts see major impacts on auto industry from Hertz possible bankruptcy. This is a huge deal, Michael. Clarissa Clarissa Haas reports that the clock is ticking. Car rental giant Hertz has less than a week to negotiate a deal with creditors in a uh, desperate attempt to avoid bankruptcy during this coronavirus pandemic. They've been just brutalized by all this. How that plays out has serious implications, though, for the new and used car markets and even for government policy, according to analysts and industry insiders. Hertz started the year with positive momentum, but two months later, according to Catherine Marinello, she's a chief executive at Hertz, on the company's first quarter earnings call, the pandemic created a major disruption as global travel demand dropped to almost zero and the used car market effectively shut down. Yeah, this is this is a big deal with ramifications out to the auto industry. The Estero, uh, uh, Florida-based Hertz Global Holdings, which is the parent of Hertz Corporation, has until Friday to come up with $400 million after it entered into agreement with some of its lenders and holders of its assets-backed securities following a default on its April lease payment. Hertz Global posted a net loss of $356 million and its adjusted corporate earnings before interest tax, depreciation, and amortization, or EBITDA, uh, was negative $243 million in the first quarter of 2020. So while the company has approximately a billion dollars in cash on the balance sheet, it has a total outstanding debt load of around $17 billion, dude. Wow, that's some, that's some good news, bad news. Good news you got a billion dollars, bad news you owe 17. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, Hertz, Hertz is reviewing. They're trying, to, they're trying to do whatever they can to save their life. They're reviewing all available options to preserve liquidity and recently announced it has canceled 90% of its remaining model year 2020 fleet orders. So now you're seeing this rub off into other economies, right, into, into that new car market. The rental car company has a fleet of more than 5,600, 5,600. Um, no, sorry, five, 560,000. <laughs> 560,000. I cannot, I can't say that number right now in North America. <laughs> it's just, it cuts too deep, Michael. They add, <laughs> there's going to be another 200,000 internationally. Closely linked to its effect on the rental car company is that that whole tour, tourism industry, hospitality industry, airports, where I believe 66% of, of the rental cars are picked up. So not a good time to be in that space at all. No, it absolutely, it really absolutely isn't. And 560000 What if they sell those off, wow. If Hertz files for bankruptcy protection or is allowed to sell off some of its fleets, it could potentially flood the used car market with several hundred thousand cars. I'm guessing around 560000 of them uh, triggering a price collapse. So April used cars uh, sales already fell by 34% from 2019, according to Mannheim. Trouble for new cars as well is approximately 20% of new car sales are derived from fleet deals with rental car companies. So these cancellations are going to have a significant impact on the automakers, which have shuttered production for nearly two months because of COVID-19 and are trying to start uh, start up, according to Jeff Schuster, president of LMC Automotives Americas Operations and Global Vehicle Forecasts. So not good news for new either. First headline, we're talking about a motor car carrier. And then uh, second headline, we're talking about those motor cars. Man, all these industries are intertwined, and we're probably going to hear about anybody involved in that space, everybody involved in that space, having a tough go of it, uh, especially as this uh, pandemic persists. But even afterwards, because it's going to take a while for business to recover. Yeah, it certainly is. And flooding the, the, the market with new uh, with used cars that are already hurting and all those dealers are already hurting. And then 20 percent stoppage of uh, potentially, I guess. I mean, that's the whole rental, right? It's 20 percent of new car sales. But even Hertz would be a, ju- if it's just Hertz, the rest of them are hurting, too, because the rental isn't there. So they're not going to be buying new cars, even if they're staying in business. Well, and, and less young people than ever are getting their license when they turn 16 and a half, 17 years old. Very people true. are not that. That old uh, middle class dream of having two cars in the white picket fence. The most people, a lot of people, don't want those two cars anymore. Especially millennial families. They, the one is fine. They can take Uber in city locations. Some don't even have any cars. So um, I. Uh. Gosh, that's going to well, be a tough spot. And, and Dooner, if you think about it as well, you've you've also got people working from home that are going to continue to keep working from home. Uh-huh. And if they're, you know, if both are at home, what do you need two cars for? Yeah, I mean, that, uh, wow, it's crazy to see what just that meteorite that hit that that industry all at once in in March of uh, of 2020, and now, you know, that's just that radioactive layer above the sky keeping the sun out.
Yeah. Uh, here's another one, and we got to call Michael Leto, but before we call him at Emerge, this is this just showed up on FreightWaves.com, so check it out. Also, you can go back to Great Quarter, guys, last Wednesday. They they had sort of a precursor to this, but Uber has shut down its self-driving, its self-driving truck program, leaving questions about Uber Freight's future. This is developing, but also, according to the Wall Street Journal, Uber cut more than 3,000 jobs. It shut 45 offices in this coronavirus crunch. The ride-hailing giant also is exploring selling non-core businesses. Could include Waymo, maybe. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Yeah. But I mean, yes. Yeah. Shut it. yeah. <laughs> Well, we don't have time to dive into this, but where do they go, Duna? FreightWaves.com, we've got the story on there, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't think that I, – I heard that they're trying to buy Grubhub. They're really trying to get deeper into – to hedge their bets and be in this space for people who are locked down and bring them food. But I don't know. Let's call Michael Lito up, though. Let's see what he's been doing to navigate this pandemic because – Yeah. A, a lot of the uh, a lot of the fallout from it seems to be coming to be coming into the news cycle now and into earnings and what companies are seeing. Hey, uh, Michael Lito, this is Duner and the Dude on What the Truck. Thank you for joining us. Dude, hey, what's up? How you guys doing? We're, we're doing great, uh, except for we we just let off with some some pretty bad news. We were talking about Comcar going into Chapter Eleven. We were talking about Uber shutting down their self driving program and cutting three thousand jobs. And we were also talking about Hertz. And uh, that that rental car economy and how bad that's been. So we're starting to see a lot of the a lot of the storm from COVID nineteen land on companies. How has Emerge handled all this? Oh well, you know we've uh, we've had to have work from home policies. Our you know our business is down a, a good percentage, and it seems like it's creeping back up over the last couple of weeks here. But uh, it's been uh, it's been difficult times. It's, it's fun, you know, problem solving at its best. That's what America is all about, right? Yeah, yeah, it certainly has. And, and Michael, you know, this the the obviously this global event has exposed some of the flaws and inability to react in the in many supply chains and the shortcomings and efficiencies, uh, et cetera. What what kind of stands out to you? What are you seeing? Well, I mean, you know, the the shift in capacity, especially with you know what's going on in uh, at the port of California and uh, Los Angeles, and uh, you know across the country, it's just. You know, the, the freight is shifting as far as what's usually happening this time of year. So it's getting difficult to contract with uh, with the same trucking companies. So what we, we're seeing is, you know, broadening your carrier base is definitely the key. I know it's tough to, uh, you know, to, to, to have, you know, thousands of trucking companies set up with a, within your organization as a shipper. Uh, but, you know, utilizing, you know, some uh, other methods of connecting to capacity and just broadening the amount of reach that you have into the actual trucks out there is, is definitely the key to, uh, to success, in my opinion. Michael, you're over in Phoenix, Arizona, right? And what's, uh, what's the general mood and feeling over in Phoenix towards, towards coronavirus? Are people itching to get back out there? Are they already back out there? Do, and does Emerge have a plan to, to bring their workers back in-house? Yeah, so we've got a plan, and, and it seems like you know everybody in, uh, in in Arizona is ready to get back at it. The gyms are about to open in a couple of days. Restaurants just opened up last week, so you know it seems like things are are getting a little bit more back to normal here. As far as our company is concerned, we put a, a plan together. Uh, you know, a pretty thoughtful plan as far as our our workforce is concerned, and uh, it's going to be a four week phased in approach of, uh, of 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 voluntary work from office. So. You know, anybody that wants to come into the office now has the ability to do so. We're doing it in, in waves as far as, uh, you know, we're bringing about 20 people per week are allowed to come back at this point. So, you know, just try to try to take a thoughtful approach to it. Uh, you know, we don't want to put anybody in harm, and uh, but we do want to get back and start building our culture again and, and, and get that camaraderie going. Nice. So, Michael, you were you were talking about earlier how, you know, getting the capacity in the right places and, and freight is not moving from the usual places. Things are a little bit different right now. The fragmentation of the of the of the of really the markets, what's up, what's down, things that are moving. So how do you see and how do we optimize but also prepare for this type of disruption? What do you what do you what do you see? How do you how do you, uh, you know, future uh, prepare yourself for this type of thing? Well, just, you know, connecting to more capacity. That's really the key here. If you take the average shipper in the United States, they contract with about 15 providers. You know, there's hundreds of thousands of trucking companies out there. And, uh, you know, even the most sophisticated of shippers, the, the Fortune 500 companies might have, you know, 150 to 200 vendors that they, they contract with. That's just not really, you know, connecting to the capacity as, as efficiently and effectively as you possibly can. So, 
you know, even for the small, small to mid-sized shipper, all the way up to those Fortune 500, uh, 100 shippers, it's really just, you know, broadening your reach to capacity because it is going to get, uh, it's going to get weird over the next few months here. Uh, and as you said, you know, everything's shifting around and it's different than it's been before. So, you know, what you, what you thought was uh, the, the perfect solution for you, you know, three, four months ago uh, is now not that solution. So, you know, really just broadening your, your scope as far as, um, as far as capacity is out there is, is really going to be the key to, to success. Michael, optimization was was such a big topic of discussion leading up to the COVID-19 pandemic, especially in the freight tech space. Has this changed the definition of being optimized, though? And how do you remain prepared for disruption, keeping some excess on hand while at the same time remaining lean and being optimized? Well, yeah, I think it has. That optimization definitely has changed over the last uh, couple of months as far as the definition is concerned. You know, and, and there's been a few articles that have uh, that have come out, you know, stating that companies are going to be more inclined to, you know, adopting technologies in order to be better prepared for a situation like this. So, you know, optimization has changed. Um, you know, it used to be used pretty loosely, but I think now there's going to be, uh, you know, a narrowed focus on optimization. And, you know, we're talking about trucks, right? So, you know, connecting to trucks, connecting to as many uh, trucks as you possibly can. Uh, and doing it in the most efficient and effective way that you possibly can. That's that's really you know what the de- definition of optimization is now in this industry uh, from a trucking standpoint. So you know we're seeing that uh, you know companies are uh, more inclined now to start discussing technology and and how they can utilize it in order to stay in front of situations like this. Interesting stuff, Michael. So, you know, getting that more capacity and partnering with more and more capacity or, or more various forms, despair forms of capacity, et cetera. How do you do that in a crisis like this? Like Dooner was saying, you know, freight markets are up, freight markets are down. You don't have the business. You're going to have the business. It's changing here and there. How do you build those relationships and, and garner more uh, partnerships with this capacity during a crisis like this? Well, I mean, it's embracing all the all the different forms of connecting to that capacity. So, you know, broadening your reach to uh, to trucking companies directly. Obviously, there's brokers out there that that help you connect to that capacity. The digital brokers are trying to bring the the truck closer to the shipper through technology, and then platforms, you know, like Emerge and uh, and some of the other platforms out there. It's uh, you know, it's kind of an all hands on deck type of a situation now, as far as um, you know, trying to get these shippers and, and give them tools to better connect to capacity. So that's really, you know, what we see here. This news is, is new about Uber, but what do you make of, of Uber freight? And do you think that they can come out of this, out of this fine and, uh, and Waymo they're, they're shutting down the self-driving space. You know, they're, they're kind of hits for our freight tech space out here. Yeah. I mean, they're going to have to start making money at some point, you know, when you see their financials <laughs> come out. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's kind of daunting just to look at. Um, you know, I know Uber's got some deep pockets, and and we hope they do. You know, every every you know technology provider in the in the space is something that we get excited about, just to see that the technology is coming and that you know the the investor money is coming into this industry because uh, you know it's really just primed to you create great solutions that are going to change the way that this industry runs. So. You know, I hope that they make it, and and you know, we partner with Uber. Um, you know, they're they're partners in our platform, so you know, we're 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 hopeful that uh, that they're gonna they're gonna make it out okay. They're definitely growing pretty rapidly. Yeah, yeah, they they are. I guess, but their golden goose is just the whole pandemic. You know, nobody taking as many Ubers. It's been tough. Michael, how do people reach out and learn more about Emerge? Yeah, they could reach us at a uh, emergemarket.com. And find out any information that they uh, that they'd like to find out. EmergeMarket.com. Thank you very much for joining us today. Always always love connecting with the uh, with the letters on here and, and talking to Emerge. Thanks thanks again, man. Yeah, thanks guys. Take care. Thanks, Michael. Take care. Ah, oh, huh. What do you make of all? I thought that was I mean I thought that was a good end. If you go to our comments section, for example, J- James Dean Anderson, he has a different opinion. He says Uber shutting down the self driving arm of their business is good for regular drivers. Yeah, I mean, maybe I don't know if I necessarily agree with that because uh, the technology was not that mature. But he also Uber has shown very little care for their contractors or workforce. So, uh, you know, not everybody. Some people cheering it, some people not. I think that what Michael was saying, though, resonated a bit with me that in terms of freight tech, if you like technology in the space, it's good to see investments going there. And it's not good to see players leaving that space.
Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. There's there's definitely varying opinions, but I'm on the side with, with you and Michael as well. You don't want to see uh, investments into new technology not happening. That's exactly what we need to actually prepare ourselves for this type of disruption in the future, but also become much more efficient in, in moving goods and with our supply chain. So it, 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 it's never a good, good thing to see somebody go out like that or, or see them struggling. I hope they make it as well. And Thomas Smiley says, yet people continue to use Uber. People don't care as a whole if they are getting pricing they like. It's it's human nature. Yeah, if you're getting the price and you're not having service failures, and uh, I, know, I know some drivers use them just for the guaranteed detention. I know they drop that from like seventy to forty dollars or something like that. But um, you know, it's it's still there. But again, rough rough market. We do have another call now. We're going to call Lawrence Alvardo. He's the co-founder and CEO at Warecap. Let's dial him up and see what's going on in the industrial space. Yeah. Another area that's been. Hi, it's Lawrence. Hey, hey, Lawrence, what's going on, man? They are getting. Hey, man, how are you? We're doing good. Would you mind turning us down a little bit in the background? And you're not. Yeah, I'm trying to. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> like I couldn't, I couldn't find the volume, but there we go. Hey, we, I, yeah. something cool about you is that you are a professor at the Catholic University of America. What are you teaching students these days, and how has COVID altered lessons? Boy, that's a great question. So I have, um, I teach a data class, and essentially it's really trying to get a lot of the students uh, apprised of how things flow from one end to the next. In other words, if you're accessing an app, if you're uh, using Postmates or whatever, just by hitting a button, it is not by just some magic that you have some meal that shows up. There's an enormous amount of data. There's an enormous amount of uh, insert tab A into slot B that has to uh, occur in order to get that that meal to your uh, to your door. So you know that's what I teach. So it's a little bit of supply chain and just trying to figure out how all of the data goes from from point A to B. But it has changed in the sense that, of course, like every other educator here within the United States uh, and, and around the world, we have gone to uh, asynchronous and synchronous learning, different types of platforms. You know, Zoom has been wonderful, uh, as, as well as other types of uh, uh, collaborative uh, learning platforms. But what it has done is that it has forced a certain amount of initiative on students to exercise that extra mile where before there has been the opportunity to go ahead and just perhaps sleep during class or maybe even sleep during a Zoom meeting, the creativity that it allows a professor to use their, quite frankly, entrepreneurial skills to engage people and to make things relevant and then also have the students to be that much more engaged has, has changed. I actually think it's, it's quite good. Wow, I, I never looked at it from that perspective, Dooner I, and Lawrence. That's that's really good stuff. To uh, as far as getting them more and more engaged. So there's yet we find these little silver linings. But uh, getting to wear caps, uh, you, you're, or wear cap. Your site reads that no matter how big or small, wear cap can handle your industrial real estate needs. We've got you covered with warehouse rack, parking, yard, and freezer cooler space, big or small, full-time or flex. So that's a lot of stuff to talk about here and kind of unpack, but how are these segments, how have you seen them uh, start to change, and how will they change post-COVID? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, I think we can just go back and look at industrial real estate as, as a composite and know that this has been just a growing industry. So over the next 10 years, it's effectively going to double to about a $26 billion industry. That doesn't really uh, get to the impact, especially at a local level, because what is happening right now is that, you know, just like they say Washington, D.C. is the Hollywood for ugly people, uh, you know, in, industrial real estate is kind of that, is experiencing that Washington, D.C. moment and the fact that it's been off the board, but it's experiencing demand that is absolutely off the charts right now. So what is happening is that we're going to see that increasing demand. We see a lot of private equity companies and investment that are, are that are growing uh, net new industrial real estate. But what is happening also is that as we post COVID nineteen localize certain things, as we drive into more localization of supply chains, as we look at the last mile fulfillment, I, you know, I mentioned Postmates. Well, think about the Postmates of everything. Think about the farm to table of everything. Everything now becomes localized. Everything now has to be 
staged at these community areas. So industrial real estate, not just warehouses, but freezer coolers, yard space, being able to stage trailers, being able to stage uh, low boys, all these different types of things now become extremely important. And as a matter of fact, when you guys were talking about Hertz, my kind of short space, flex space mind was thinking about all of the new parking lots that were going to be available for staging okay. things. So, so it just it has this opportunity now that you have all of this capacity that has been hiding in plain sight for all of these years that are going to become that much more available, but you need a transaction platform to quickly connect everything. So do you think that this, so we're hearing about all these companies that that may be shutting down. We talk about retail later. We'll also get into some of the shutdowns there, but we just mentioned Hertz. You brought it back up. Do you think that there'll be a lot of buyers positioned to pick up a lot of this industrial space that's going to be vacated? Absolutely, I do. I absolutely think it is because a lot of what is being uh, a big limiting factor at the moment is just flat land. There's not a lot of land that is being available. And so what is happening, is, in, in fact, there's a, uh, a particular case in California at the moment where a, uh, you know, near the airport, where a, a, a really well, well-known company spent, well, I won't even tell you, but they spent an enormous amount of money, essentially a, a money that would be reserved for prime commercial real estate. They bought effectively a, a building knock it down so they can build a parking lot. So so the land and the access to just flat land in order to build warehouses and, and access to these types of things are off the chart. So I I can guarantee that people are going to be looking to go ahead and, and swoop up, uh, hopefully, at fire sale prices. But I, I think they have another thing coming. Hey, Michael Vincent sent me an email saying you would, you would play your kid's trumpet. Did you bring the trumpet? Oh my gosh! I, I I actually did bring the trumpet. Yes, play the you, trumpet. Yeah, you promised Lawrence last 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 Thursday. You promised you'd uh, play a few notes for us. I got my kids ukulele. They're the legal get a little ukulele here. Having a little let's see. So. <laughs> Wow. That, was, that was that was excellent. That was what uh, is going on it, here? <laughs> kind of brings sunshine to these uh, these terrible times, man. Uh, before we let you go, one interesting nugget that you had on there was you were talking about the the hidden supply chain. What is the hidden supply chain? Because you wrote that it's more visible than ever. Yeah, the uh, the hidden supply chain in this particular case is more of the hidden excess supply chain. So, in other words, there has been so many opportunities for us to look space or, or market. So in other words, it's been there, but it just hasn't been able to connect. So for example, if you have like a 5,000 square foot you know, space in a large warehouse, well, it, it, there's no way to connect it. So uh, uh, for example, where it be a razor, or perhaps there is a pack uh, lot somewhere where you're able to be the 300 advantage or something. So again, all of that stuff is out there, but it just never has been able to been aggregated and connected. So that's what I mean by by kind of um, space that being planned. Well, wow. hey, Lawrence, we really appreciate your time today. We got to get to our next guest, but how do people reach out and learn more if they want some advice on, on navigating this really challenging industrial space market right now? Hopefully you can find me on this show again. But uh, secondly, it's uh, wherecap.com, that's W-A-R-E-C-A-P.com, or you can find me on LinkedIn as well as our uh, Wherecap uh, LinkedIn page. Oh, yeah. We're going to have you and Lance Healy on at the same time, so you can play the trumpet, and he can play the uh, he can play the, the harmonica, and then Vince can bring in his bass. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> I was going to say we'll definitely have Lawrence back on for his insights into the supply chain, but I wasn't so sure people would be calling for an encore performance of the trumpet plan, but... <laughs> <laughs> I, I was fantastic, man. <laughs> for you, Michael Vincent, with that attitude. Uh, hey, <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. Take care, guys. All right. Cheers. Thanks a lot. That, that, I, I love a guy who stands up to his, his promise, too. And, and people out there, if you ever want to get on What the Truck, just definitely lead with your instrument skill playing, uh, your instrument ability. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, a- absolutely. I mean, uh, he, he owned up to it. He was a casual promise last Thursday, but he was prepared. He had it ready. That was pretty solid, pretty solid.
All right, let's uh, let's talk to John Kingston. We'll see, we'll get to the bottom of what happened with Comcar, and hopefully yeah. he can fill in on the details. He did the reporting of this on FreightWaves.com. It came out yesterday. The story. Hey, John Kingston, thank you for joining Dooner and the Dude on What the Truck. And you really are on air this time. This time I'm there. All right, I'm very excited. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> how's things in New York, man? How's uh, how's New York City? Some people have told me it's kind of post-apocalyptic there right now. Well, I you know I live in the suburbs, and I have not set foot in the city since I think February. So um, I know some people, my, my son, actually, I, I, I took my son back. He was going to graduate school there. And that was the one day I drove in in March to bring him home. But uh, I, I hear people have driven in and, you know, just to see what it's like with all the empty streets. But I can tell you that, that like a lot of the country, there is, seems to be a lot more traffic on the road. And my guess is that I'm not saying city streets are jam packed, but I'll bet they're a lot more wide, a lot more tighter space than they were in March or early April. So we covered a little bit of, of the Comcar story to lead the show in our headline section here. Let's dive a little bit deeper into it. How did it get on your radar? What, it, what, have, you, what have you found out, and what has developed since you wrote the story? Well, I, uh, they put out a press release yesterday and got a call. Let's, let's write it up. Um, I didn't have much to go on except the press release and looked up some background of the company. Um, did send a note out to their officers, didn't hear back. But they, they dropped their... Uh, Chapter 11 filings into the federal bankruptcy court late yesterday, and I've been reading them now. In fact, I'm getting ready to post the story to FreightWaves.com now. Uh, I mean, I think the, the key thing here is that the jobs are not going to be eliminated. They're talking about 950 jobs that are going to be saved. There are buyers for all the operating units. So this is not like Celadon, where the drivers out there are getting notices to get your, you know, get your butt back, uh, you know, deliver your load, and get yourself back to, to home on your own. Uh, or here's a bus ticket. Uh, these are going to continue to operate as going concerns until the sales of these assets are completed. Uh, there's no reason to believe that these sales won't be completed. So I mean, I think that this is, you know, this is the way Chapter 11 is supposed to work. A company files for protection so they can keep going, and uh, they sell off the assets to supply the debtors. You know, the company itself is a holding company. They own you know, four key assets. Uh, there's a flatbed carrier. There's a reefer and dry van business is a chemical carrier and there's a bulk carrier and uh they're going to have new owners so i think it's kind of good news all around i mean it's maybe not good for the debtors that they don't get paid in full but um you know that's that's the banking business yeah so uh john mike vincent here it, I, you covered really why chapter 11 because it allows them to operate while they're going through this type of stuff but uh, so are the the individual companies are continuing to operate through this bankruptcy process Yes, yes, it is. I mean, among among the bankruptcy filings, you know, there's lots of documents, but there's also documents. I guess they're probably standard operating procedure, allowing asking the bankruptcy court to allow the company to continue to pay its employees. Which I guess you've got to you've got to make that request. Otherwise, the the debtors might say, no, we've got a claim on that money. You know, shut shut it down now and start paying us. But uh, right now, the companies are continuing to operate. Uh, 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 Compar put in a request to allow the payment to continue. And there's nothing that I've seen here that uh, suggests that there's going to be any kind of a shutdown. Are, are the buyers getting a good deal here, in your opinion, the people who are picking up these assets and these companies? White Willow is an interesting company because they, we, back when Celadon was going on, they gave a cash infusion to them. Didn't work out. Here they are again, pick, going after some struggling companies. Well, what do you make well, of you all know, that? Well, you know what's interesting about White Willow? So White Willow was mentioned in the... Um, was mentioned in the the press release that came out yesterday. Now, in the dot, there's you know, there's got to be like 20, 25 documents connected to this. But it, the, the, the most interesting one was filed by a guy named Andrew Hinkleman, who has come from FTI Consulting. They were brought in a couple of months ago, and now um, and now he's the chief restructuring officer at uh, Comcar. And uh, in in this document, he kind of spells out how the company got to where it was. But he talks about the sale of MCT. Um, which was the, uh, the that's the reefer and dry van carrier, and in the press release yesterday, it said that MCT was going to be sold to White Willow, and then in the document today it says there are discussions about selling MCT. There's interest, but White Willow is not actually mentioned. So I'm not saying that that means they're not the company that has expressed interest, but it was just sort of notable that they were not identified by name in the Hinkleman document. 
So in this request to keep the uh, the companies operating to the debtors through the Chapter 11, 11, uh, 11 uh, filing, there has got to be evidence in there to those debtors that these are sellable assets and that there's going to be bidders, which obviously there, there certainly are. So that's good news. But, uh, but prior to this, uh, do you have any insights on what attempts were made to avoid breaking the company up and, and maybe why those didn't work? Well, they uh, not not not, to, not too specific. They had debt issues for a while. In fact, they they, they traced their debt problems back to a, a loan they took out in 2014. I guess that first started their burden. Uh, operating wise, they lost. Hang on, let me look. They lost 25 million last year, uh, and they were right on track to do the same this year. They lost six million through the first quarter, and you got to figure if they were you know the second quarter. Well, I was going to say they're still in business. They are still in business. You got to figure the second quarter numbers will be a disaster. I mean, so they were almost certainly going to exceed the thirty million dollar, the twenty five million dollar loss from last year. Uh, last year in December, when they, they, like at, by the end of December, they were recording revenue drops. Uh, you know, twenty six percent in one unit, forty four percent in another one. So they had a lot of problems, and uh, they've taken on a lot of debt over the years, and uh, it just ultimately crushed them. They had a. It looks like they had a. It looks like they might have had a $14 million balloon payment in June, and I guess they were probably wondering uh, how they were going to make that. John, their leadership took a big hit, right? Randy Clark, Comcar CEO, he was only appointed to head the company just last year. He died unexpectedly in April. Uh, did that play any part in this, the, the disruption in leadership? How did he, how did he die? Do you, do you know what, what went on there? It, but it just said, I mean, I, I actually found the story in the Jacksonville Business Journal about his death, and it just said he died suddenly. You know, he seemed to be young and healthy and active and um as far as did his death help cause this I, I don't think so i mean he he just got named to the post in december um and, you know he was i don't know if he had enough time to try to turn it around uh maybe uh, maybe that was the final straw but uh this this company sounds like it wasn't too healthy to begin with oh that's tough Hey, John Kingston, uh, your story's up on FreightWaves.com. Everyone can go out there and check it out. And I know you have a no, drill. Yet. Your, pod yet. your podcast, Drilling Deep, is coming out this week. Uh, wh who's coming up on it this week? Oh, I'm very excited about this week. Um, I've got an attorney that I know, that I've known for years, uh, from Chicago, named Jerry Matman. Uh, Jerry's one of the leading labor lawyers in the country. But he usually works for business. And we're going to be talking about, uh, we're going to be talking about the, you know, post-COVID-19 uh, scenario with employers, excuse me, employees suing their employers over over the uh, the virus and how that's going to play out. That's going to be a whole new area of employee versus employer litigation. So uh, Jerry's already written about it. Uh, given where, given what he does for a living, he's been looking at this very closely, and I'm interviewing him pretty soon, and I'm looking looking forward to it. Yeah, I have to imagine companies are, are – that's one of the big fears about sending employees back to work. If, if you do it too soon, does it open you up to liability? What, uh, what legally do you have to do as a company to protect yourself uh, and, you know, and protect your employees' health, but also protect yourself from uh, you know, the sharks out there swimming around trying to bring you into court? Yeah, well, we're going we're gonna to talk about that. It'll, it'll be available on Thursday on Drilling Deep. All right, guys, subscribe to Drilling Deep or subscribe to FreightCast on your favorite podcast player of choice, and you can hear more from John Kingston and check out his articles on FreightWaves.com. John, stay healthy out there, man. You too. Thanks, guys. Take it Thanks, easy. Thanks, John. Wow, so uh, big story, big story, man. Uh, a lot in the news today. I mean, this is a show that could have, we could have, this show could have been entirely about Hertz. It could have been entirely about Comcar. It could have been entirely about Uber. Yeah, we could have dug in very, very deep, and especially with John Kingston, always always insightful, but we could absolutely separate these out into multi-hour shows on each one of those topics because the ramifications and this fallout and is um, can run very, very deep. Yeah, those are, those are all big deals, and uh, now it's time for Emily Zink as we do a yeah. little thing we like. Big deal, little deal. Big deal. Little deal. Big deal. Little deal. <laughs> Boom. Yeah, like you, hey, Dooner, like you said, a lot going on right now in the news and even more stories right here. Uh, one of the big stories is last week was the best week for load volumes since March. They're now up 5% year over year. Is this a big deal or a little deal? Uh, I guess I'll take that one. It's, it's, yes. uh, it is up 5%. It's big because we're looking for any silver lining. We're looking for any upward swing as we can. You know, we saw a lot of the earnings. We're seeing companies file Chapter 11. We're seeing some devastating losses to the space with, with what's going on with Hertz and 
and what we're going to talk about in retail in a little bit. So yeah, big, big, big deal. A any freight volume helps. If you look at the load boards, it's not showing up there yet, but the tender rejections up a little bit. So hopefully this will reflect on, uh, we're reflecting the load boards coming soon. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to agree with uh, with Dooner on that one. It, it is a big deal, and it really speaks to uh, the resiliency and the, de the pent-up demand that's in the economy, and, and the industry is coming back on. It is a big deal to continue to watch this. As Dooner said, uh, you know, capacity has not tightened to a point where rejections are high enough to really affect the overall spot market, uh, which will support some of those smaller carriers and, and some of those carriers that are hurting right now, obviously, through this, this whole pandemic. Uh, but it is definitely a big deal, and it's it's a big deal to watch all the rest of the supply chain, the maritime and the air cargo, et cetera, and the rail and how they're going to be able to pivot and hopefully keep this uh, sustained uh, uh, recovery going. Plus, it, it helps stoke the, uh, the, the feud internally between Zach Strickland and CEO and founder Craig Fuller as they, uh, they argue about the results of the great debate. Where uh, Craig was right, right? I mean, he was right. He lost, but he was right. Yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. He was absolutely right. It, it broke the 9,300 mark by the 15th, but there's still some days left. And, uh, you know, this latest over the weekend is a normal stair step over the weekend where it kind of flattens a little bit. So we'll see what goes on this week. But uh, certainly last week was a, a very positive side. Well, trucking companies are realigning their hiring practices to focus on more experienced drivers as the number of student drivers falls 35% because of COVID-19. Vincent, big deal or little deal? I think it's a big deal because it's another thing. You know, driver supply as we try and recovery, recover, we're going to need drivers to move this to, to move the freight and potentially stall the, the the supply chains if we don't have drivers. And we are already hurting for drivers capacity re out, out positioned or, or not positioned correctly, et cetera, that type of thing. But 35 percent of new drivers not coming in is or, or in the schools down is not a good. You know, that's not good for the supply chain of new drivers. No, Chris, Chris Jolly says it's a great thing to see that number rise. I'm going to say on this one, it's a uh, it's a little deal. There's drivers out there who already have, who've already graduated, who, who need their loads to pull, right? And we don't have a driver shortage right now. If we do, the load boards wouldn't look like they do. You know, maybe in the future we will. But right now, these drivers are, are doing everything they can to pick up the loads. They don't need any more competition from, from the CDL school. So the market will regulate itself. Once this COVID-19 pandemic goes down, more people will be able to go to schools. And hopefully that'll buy some time in the meantime for capacity to constrict a little bit. A good point there. Well, Say Say Logistics pays more than $150,000 to recover Celadon trucks that were quarantined in Mexico. Dooner, is this a big deal or a little deal? It's a big deal in the sense that you have to, you really have to manage your risk and you have to be careful what partners you use. Now, I, I'm not saying that the, the company here knew that Celadon was on its last legs or Jaguar was on its last legs or anything, but understanding that the health of companies and, and all that kind of stuff is, is a pretty big deal because then when your freight gets stuck uh, in Mexico and quarantined, I mean, that was in what, January and now it's, it's May, so I mean, who, who even wants that freight anymore? And I believe they were pulling for Volkswagen, weren't they? So now you got a bunch of automobiles, you finally get them back, nobody wants them. So that, that's a big loss for everybody, and things like that can be really difficult. And they paid 152000 but I imagine that the end total is going to cost everybody a lot more here than just that figure. Yeah, I agree that it is a big deal from the perspective of you got to look at your partners and know where your partners are. It's a big deal to show what the fallout from a shutdown like Celadon had is, as opposed to how Comcar is doing it, uh, is a little bit is a little bit better. I don't know that they had a choice, but it, it is a big deal from that perspective. And I think the number is closer to like six hundred and fifty eight million or, or a thousand or something like that. It's actually going to cost say say because they owed some things that they had to pay to debtors of Saladon and able and able to get these things moving. So big deal. Interesting story we have on FreightWaves.com right now. Manitoba-based carrier Paul's Hauling is credited with helping avoid the wider spread of the coronavirus from terminal thanks to protecting protective siloing of employees and close collaboration with local health authorities. Officials say just 10 cases have been linked to that carrier. Vincent, is this a big deal or a little deal? I, I think it's a big deal because they they were proactive. They saw this this coming. They didn't pretend like it wasn't going to hit Manitoba, and they took the correct action. And they were able to save lives, potential lives of of uh, their employees, and 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 
you know, slow that curve in their in their own areas. It's a, it's a great example of taking the initiative and being proactive, and I think it's a big deal. They should be uh, they should be commended for it. Yeah, he, you know, Michael just touched on that briefly. And uh, one thing that really stuck out to me in this story was they were talking about the the stigma of coming out and saying that you are a business or a trucking company that has had a COVID outbreak. There's been a lot of retaliation on on Facebook and other places. So they, they showed a lot of bravery here in getting in front of it. And this is an even bigger thing. And we should use them as a model as we move forward and everyone tries to get back into all, you know, offices and everything. We don't have a we don't have a vaccine for coronavirus, so everyone is going to have to be very, very proactive. It's going to change the way people look at sick days and everything. I mean, I, I remember working for a broker back in the day, and if you called in sick, oh my God, the glares you would get, the glares you would get just coming back into the office the next day. Hopefully, that changes uh, our cultural viewpoints on on how exactly to handle this stuff. And I think that when companies are doing this and and getting people out of harm's way and and being altruistic like this, they should be rewarded. So hey, uh, a little cowbell for for Paul's hauling and, and getting ahead of that, and hopefully we can uh, we can do similar. Yeah, they, it's an interesting story. Like I said, go to FreightWaves.com to read this one. You've been hinting at this throughout the show. UBS predicts roughly 100,000 retail stores are likely to close over the next five years. Dooner, big deal or little deal on this one? It's a it's a big deal, but with the caveat that I think that a lot of these, they're going to blame COVID, and I'm sure it's there, but a lot of these companies are walking wounded. I mean, we're seeing J.C. Penney in these filings. When has J.C. Penney had a good quarter? You know, it's been a long time since that has happened. Uh, J. Crew, they're they're in trouble. They've been in trouble for a while. So the companies that were in trouble are obviously not benefiting from this at all. What I feel bad is the small businesses. So there, you know, the, the bad thing about this event, and we look at the PPP loans, is just this. The wealth consolidation that's kind of happening, and the bigger companies are a little bit more insulated. Say, you know, not J. Crew, but a lot of the bigger ones where you're going to see a lot of mom and pop companies who just can't stave off this storm. And once everyone's let out, is it is it going to be enough for them? And we're already seeing those kind of companies close. So I think that that is that that's a definitely a huge deal. Uh, it was cool talking to to Lawrence though from WorkHap and talking about what would happen to that space were all those places to go to go out of business. And he seems to think that they wouldn't stay shuttered too long. There would just be a restructuring of industrial space. That's an inter interesting perspective. I, I think it's uh, it, it is a big deal from the mom and pop perspective. But this particular uh, story, just the hundred thousand retail stories co closing over the next five years, is kind of a bit. Uh, it's a small deal to me. It's a little deal to me. It was going to happen anyways. This has this has really forced the hand of efficiencies in where we were moving anyways. Yeah, like a lot of the malls were dying as we've been reporting on for so long. So, like you said, just unfortunately, COVID kind of sped up the process for this. But, Duna, you made a good point. A lot of the mom and pop stores, a lot of those family owned businesses, that's especially tough to see. Well, an online video out of the UK shows circuit boards with the word COVID 19 on it being installed into a 5G tower. Officials have come out to say that video, of course, contains false information. Michael Vincent, is this a big deal or a little deal? Yeah, you know, <laughs> because it was proven to be false, it, it became a, a small deal in my mind. But then thinking it through, it's really kind of a big deal because it, it it really <laughs> it really exemplifies just how uh, 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 gullible people are and the lengths that they'll go to to try and create a conspiracy theory. I mean, people actually believe that COVID was being caused by and transmitted through 5G. Is that what I'm reading through this story? <laughs> As first I heard of it, and other people were kind of surprised that I haven't heard of this, but I, I guess I just don't pay attention to these crazy conspiracy yeah, theories. Yeah, I but. mean, you're not a conspiracy theorist, I see, so that's a very good thing. But, yes, there have been some conspiracy theories going around, especially on the Internet, about 5G being linked to the coronavirus. So this is just one of those things where a fake video came out with the word COVID-19 going up in a mask. Um, yeah, so, of course, that was debunked. But, Dooner, what do you think about this one? Well, this is one of those things. It's almost like the Tide Pods, right? Like, it starts out as a 4chan meme. It's a it's a joke. A lot of people don't believe it. But then the conspiracy groups pick it up, and they're like, you know what? People are believing this, and it gets us hits on our websites, and I can sell them fluoride filters and all that kind of garbage. What I found hilarious about this is that the video, right, that he's trying to convince people with, the circuit board says COVID-19 on it, like in a cartoon when it says, like, poison on a bottle or like TNT on a stick of dynamite. Like they literally put a circuit board in there that was Cove-19 and that's gonna prove that like 5G causes, like I, what is the thinking behind the, the 5G causing COVID-19 
to begin with. Like, I, that's the one thing I don't understand. It's almost like that flat earther argument. And it's like, well, why? Why do you believe that? I think it's the radio, the radioactivity of the 5G is so intense that it's going to cause coronavirus in people. That's kind of what the people are saying, the conspiracy theorists. But that was that was funny. Like you said, like you see in a cartoon, it says TNT. I thought the same exact thing when I saw this. I'm like, who actually sees this video and thinks, hmm, if we get 5G, we're going to get coronavirus. So. But so the idea wasn't that they were transmitting the virus via 5G. It was 5G was causing the virus to mutate into COVID-19. Is that yes. it? Yes, I that, that I think is the theory, but I I have not went down the rabbit hole of this conspiracy theory, so I could be completely wrong. I try to stay surface with all this. But this next one, of course, makes perfect sense to me. Um, U.S. gamers spent more money than ever. According to the first quarter of 2020 Games Market Dynamics report from NPD, total consumer spending hit more than $10 billion. That's an increase of 9% from the same time last year. Dooner, big deal or little deal on this one? I uh, think it's a big deal because it's good to see anything grow during this period of time. And video games seems like a natural one, but in, in more ways than just people actually spending the money. It means that they're confident enough to spend a little bit of money, even though, you know, it, it means that it, it, to me, it, it indicates a little bit of consumer confidence and a little bit of confidence that they'll be making money when they come out of this thing and, and they'll be just fine. So in the meantime, they're going to shelter the storm and play some Animal Crossing and that kind of stuff. But if you're trying to get something like a Nintendo Switch, like, if Michael Vincent's daughter wanted a Nintendo Switch for her birthday, he would be going on eBay right now and spending like 475 bucks. You just can't find those things in the stores at the moment. But uh, my money's actually going more towards Lego because uh, that, that keeps the three and the five-year-old occupied. They get to build that stuff. They get to build that stuff all day long. But Lego's kind of expensive. So Lego, if you're out there, cut me a break, okay? <laughs> I agree. It's a, I agree. I agree. It's a, it's a big deal, Dooner. And from all the perspectives that you're talking about, it shows that people are confident and they're buying those things. I actually had the foresight to get my daughters the Nintendo Switch before the outbreak, so that I didn't pay the five hundred dollars for one. Uh, but yeah, it, it it shows confidence. It's a. I think it's a good thing. People are spending money when anything grows. It does. And uh, I don't buy into you know those that are, would say that maybe this is a bad thing because more and more people are getting hooked on video games, etc. I don't buy into that type of stuff. I think it is a I think it is a big deal and it is a good thing. Yeah, speaking Emily, of you yeah, so well speaking of consumer confidence, I just saw this um, Steve Ferreira, our uh, good friend from Ocean Audit, he just shared this infographic um, that says, "Honey, I got you a Peloton." And COVID-19 is big business as we knew for Peloton, but it was interesting. 92 containers came into the US from the 1st of 2019 to let's see. Uh, May 5th, sorry, the numbers are really small, of 2019, but 602 containers containing Pelotons from the 1st of 2020 to currently today. So obviously that just has skyrocketed. So things like we've been hearing in the retail sector, things like treadmills, Peloton bikes, but it's, it's just crazy and people are commenting like, I got a bike, I have an eight to 12 week wait. So that's absolutely ridiculous how big of a business this has been for Peloton. I think in a year that the Peloton used market is going to be huge because anyone who's been through an ex like home exercise equipment craze, like there was in the 80s with like treadmills or exercise bikes, you know that those things end up in the basement and they end up being a really, really expensive laundry rack. So I think that Michael Vincent, <laughs> wait, if we just hold out until like a year here, we can get some Pelotons for, for cheap. And I heard right now it, it's hard. They're like, like the Nintendo Switch, super hard to get. You know, they, they, they have optimized supply chain. They, they estimate how many buyers they would have. And there's way more people wanting Pelotons than they expected. Yeah, I'm going to agree with Dooner on this one. It's a big deal from both those <laughs> perspectives that the the used price market for Pelotons is going to crash in the fall or later this summer when people get out and start start exercising. And uh, also that uh, if you if you build laundry racks, um, your d the demand is going to is going to diminish quite quite quickly because <laughs> you have that Peloton sitting around. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Emily, are you a, are you a gamer? Do you have a Nintendo Switch at home? No, I mean, I could play some great Mario Kart, but I don't have anything like that. I used to have a Game Boy when I was younger, but yeah, I heard it's incredibly tough to get a Switch right now in any kind of game system. I know a lot of people, That's that's been their thing. They've been playing their video games, staying inside. That's one way to keep a lot of people in a certain age group occupied, so it makes sense that gaming's gone up. I would be one of those people who'd go out and buy a Peloton bike, but I, I know the used market is going to be really good here pretty soon, and I'm savvy like that when it comes to my finances, so you made a good point. I'm going to wait a little bit, but a lot of people are trying to work out at home so 
I did. I, I've seen a commercial for. I think it's called the Pulse or something. It's like a, a weightlifting bench that you can fold into your wall. A digital weightlifting bench. Have you guys seen that? that I have. I have. That actually looks pretty cool. You can actually digitally adjust the weights and take different training classes and weightlifting classes right on that video screen on the wall. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it, it falls into a really small footprint, which like for apartment dwellers like Emily and myself, you get a Peloton. That's going to eat up a lot of space. No, exactly. And for me, I can't just hop on the bike every single day. It's great to do two or three times a week, but you get kind of bored with it. I, I know people who have it and they absolutely love it. But for me, I need to switch up my workout. So that gym you were talking about that builds into the wall, that's that's something I think that is has a little more allure to it than just riding a bike every single day. Wow. Well, Emily, what's coming up next on Freight Waves TV? Well, of course, unfortunately, as we say, we, we just want the coronavirus freight market update to be over with. But in, as we've talked about a lot of this episode, it continues to be headline news, whether it's the virus itself or what it's doing to the economy. So every Tuesday and Thursday at noon, we'll have the coronavirus freight market update. We also have Freightnomics on Wednesday. I'm going back to Tuesday, great quarter guys at two. Freightnomics at two on Wednesday. And of course, put that coffee down is at noon on Wednesdays. Everyone loves having conversations on LinkedIn or Facebook during that show. Thursdays, we have, like I said, coronavirus freight market update at noon and then freight forecasting with Michael Vincent at 4. And I forgot with Sonar on um, Wednesdays at 4 to 4.30. And then Friday again, we are back here for What the Truck at Noon. So every day you have something to look forward to at noon. And it's a different show, different genre every single day almost. So um, absolutely love that. And we love the LinkedIn connections we're getting and the interaction throughout the show. So definitely keep it coming. Yeah, on Wednesday, Trent Broberg from truckstop.com is going to be on Put That Coffee Down. We're going to talk to, to someone of, of, of his executive about uh, what sales is going to look like post-COVID in terms of uh, the decorum for, for sales calls, for going back to the office, for visiting other people's office, business travel, all that stuff. Excited to talk to him. Then on What the Truck, Michael Vince and I are going to talk to Doug Potvin from Trinity Logistics. We've also got someone from CargoCast coming on. They're still waiting to confirm who exactly that will be. And uh, Brian Schreiber of the Columbus Regional Airport will also be on. Uh, man, that's talk about brutalized markets, man. That's That's been a tough one, just like that rental car space. Yeah, and Dooner, then again on Friday on What the Truck, we've got Ken Sherman from IntelliTrans, CEO at IntelliTrans, which is interesting. They track a lot of the the uh, very upstream supply chain, so the, the, the materials coming out of the ground coming to manufacturing. So we'll get a good update from him and see what he's seeing in that space, too, see if it's supporting this, uh, this recovery or, or what's happening there, which will be interesting. Wow, Stack Stack Show. If you want to get all that stuff and you don't want to miss any of it, subscribe to Freightcast. Every single Freightwaves podcast is there. Just put up a new Fuller Speed Ahead this morning from Freightwaves Live at Home. There'll be more events podcasts being added to that, plus all our regular shows. John Kingston was on earlier, of course. You heard about his show, Drilling Deep. If you haven't listened to that, check it out. It's about a 25-minute journey into uh, – the world of oil, but he also, you know, he drills deep on many other things as well. Also, download the free Freight Waves TV app. You can catch all of these shows after they air. And while they do air, make sure to follow us on LinkedIn and Facebook, right? So you can interact with us live. We did have a couple comments here. Chris Jolly said, is heavy-duty tinfoil the best for protection? Uh, could, could be. Could be. Could avoid the, uh, could avoid the fluoride. Got to put on the tinfoil hat, right? And then send all your money to Alex Jones. Because <laughs> he has no vested interest in conspiracy, right? Uh, Jake McLeod, people are stuck home and looking to connect with others. Why not have a Mario Kart night with friends online? Yeah, I mean, no better use case for online gaming than a, a pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. My daughters play, uh, what is it called, Roblox or something? So they, they play various different games. They create these uh, avatars, and then they play these different kids' games with their with their girlfriends from down the street, et cetera, all night long, that type of thing. It's kind of a party gaming type of thing, and they can see each other's avatar within the game. Pretty cool stuff. They play an Animal Crossing on that Switch, your daughters? Uh, they are not yet, no. Okay. It's, it's, I don't get that game. It's kind of boring. You just walk around. Like, nobody attacks you. You just walk around a village, like, digging things up and selling up to this crook, Tom Nook. It's, it's, it's all right. I don't know. You can follow me at Timothy Dooner on Twitter. That's D-O-O-N-E-R. You can follow him at Vincent the Dude. Look us both up on LinkedIn. Michael Vincent, Timothy Dooner. Uh, download that episode. Thank you.